in our gospel today, Jesus speaks about fruit. So um, we don't, we're not very familiar with fig trees here in Ireland. Um, I lived in Italy for a while. Uh, I'm still not very familiar with fig trees, but apparently uh, fig trees are supposed to have fruit on them. There's supposed to be something useful on them practically all year. Even before the, the figs themselves are formed, the buds of them can still be eaten. The buds are still kind of sweet. Um, and then I think, I think they maybe even have a, a crop of figs twice a year. Anyway, point being, all year there's supposed to be something useful on them. Uh, so when this landowner, this uh, owner of the vineyard comes and uh, for three years now finding no fruit on it, that's for a, for a fig tree that's catastrophic. Like, cause like that's just pure useless. That's really like, that's unacceptable. After three years, if they haven't produced anything, time to go. Uh, so, and this uh, uh, dedicated gardener, let's call him Bohush, decides that he will he will uh, volunteer, right, to take particular care of this tree and dig around it and manure it and take, you know, take care of it to help it to produce fruit. Now, what's interesting is uh, this, obviously, the fig tree is us, okay? Uh, we're expected to bear fruit. Now, if we don't bear fruit, it's not like the Lord cuts us down immediately. We're, we're given chance, and dare I say we're given chance after chance after chance. It's not just we're given one chance. But he, he does expect fruit from us. This is a question that in, in missionary circles or in ministry circles or in, in parish and diocesan circles, this is the question no one wants to ask, right? What fruit is there from this particular initiative or this particular idea? Because it's, it's, this, this is the hard question. This is the kind of the ugly question. The question isn't, are we all busy? The question isn't, have we a youth ministry team or have we a parish ministry team or have we a team for this, that and the other? The, the, the important question is, what's the fruit of these teams or initiatives? Because by, by their fruit, you will know them. But this is the question, that, as I say, people don't want to ask because usually the answer is fairly obvious. It's fairly black and white. Um, I remember I was asking, we, there was a meeting here in the diocese and there was a so-called expert in youth ministry uh, who was invited down to talk to us. And um, so he was telling us about all these things that were going on in his diocese. And I'm, I'm, I know a bit of what's going on in his diocese. Uh, and unfortunately, as far as I can see anyway, the fruit is very, very little. I mean, there's lots of people involved, big budget involved, money and things and people and big splashes, but uh, bottom line, uh, it doesn't result in faith. So I decided I'd ask the hard question. Up went the paw, and I said, hi, uh, just uh, wondering, um, these are all these things that are going on. Could you give me an example maybe of some things that have gone on that have failed? Because it's also good to know like, what things have been tried that didn't work. Uh, and then how do we measure success, right? So he said, well, failed? Well, I don't think anything I've tried has failed. Um, I think, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. And secondly, he said, when it com comes to measuring fruit, he said, well, you know, uh, this is the kind of thing you one can't really measure, measure fruit because it's all in the hearts of people. Now, I get what he's saying. Yes, of course, when we're, talk we're talking about faith and a relationship with Christ, you can't measure that or weigh it. But at the same time, if mass attendance doesn't increase by one person, if, um, as regards like the common, ordinary Catholic expressions of faith, there is no difference whatsoever, then dare I say it's not effective. You know, but as I said, like, these are the questions we don't want to ask. It's the hard question. It's, a, it's, it's, it's unco very uncomfortable. And it can be very disheartening as well, because sometimes you're just trying and trying and trying. And the fruit may be very little. Now, that said, when we say the fruit is very little, one, one heart converted, one soul brought back to the Lord is worth every cent that you've invested in, this, in, in your initiative, whatever that may be. We have a lot of missions over in Russia. And if you go to my community, the uh, work of Jesus, the high priest, uh, but if you want to measure the success of those missions, like uh, it's, it's small. It's small because you have to undo so much hurt and addiction and being lied to by, for generations by, by communism. And abject poverty and uh, families that are just broken in a million pieces and you know you have to overcome all that but 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 there is fruit like there are young people who come back and 
overcome their addictions and form good families. And there are people who on their deathbeds, yes, it might have been the, the 11th hour, but do come back to the Lord. But there is fruit. There is fruit. It's, 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 it's stony ground, but there is fruit. But if, if our goal isn't to produce fruit, then what are we doing? We're just busying ourselves for our own glory. And that's, that's not what the Lord is calling us to, because the time will come when we're going to be cut down. Like we're only here for a short time. We're only here on earth for a short time, and then we're gone. So what are we going to do while we're here? Uh, one difficulty, obstacle, dare I call it uh, temptation, in the church which can really hamper our youth ministry in general uh, or any form of ministry, any, any form of renewal, is mediocrity and just kind of settling. Have you ever met someone, and it, it's an awful expression I, that you may have heard around the, the place, but when a lady decides, you know, I want to get married, doesn't really matter to who, <laughs> you know, and then you hear the expression said, uh, you know, bless us, she's gone off with himself, she's married himself, she's after settling, isn't she? But not settling in the, as in settling down, but settling as in settling for less. You know, she, she just, whatever, it didn't really matter as long as there was someone there, you know. And it, it's, a, it's, it, it's an awful thing to, to say or to, to think, it's an awful reality when people settle. I, mean, I know someone who, who was marrying a guy who she knew she didn't really love, she was marrying a project more than a person because he was just desperately immature. And uh, yeah, it has proven to be a very difficult marriage. She's with him and he's like another child. Uh, doesn't pull his weight, doesn't show her any affection, understanding, doesn't really listen to her. Terrible, but you could see from the right, you could see right from the beginning, it's not gonna work. Uh, she settled. This can happen in the church as well, where we, we settle for, for our just being busy. We settle for having our projects and having our things, but not for greatness. We settle for mediocrity. I heard a story once told by a priest when I was, I was over in the States, and he was addressing a number of, of priests uh, before we went to hear confessions. This was a, was a Sikh in Indiana a couple of years ago. So there were, I don't know, maybe 300 priests there. And so a priest came up, came up to give us an address. And he said, we will never understand the power of confession this side of eternity. And the greatness of the mercy of God which flows through us every time we give the absolution to a soul. And he said, it's just so tragic, so worse than unfortunate. It's so sad when we as priests settle for mediocrity. He said, there's a story told of when the Americans found the, the, the American soldiers found the Dachau camp, the concentration camp after the war. They went in to liberate the people who, the prisoners who were left there, who were uh, starving and beaten and completely just emaciated on death's door, really. And they had a translator there just to talk to people about what they needed, what, 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 who you are, who, who can we contact. And they came across a priest, and the priest was, was in tears. And so the, the soldiers asked through the translator, what's, well, this is kind of an obvious question in a way, really, what's wrong? I mean, everything's wrong. But they, they said, what's, what's wrong? They asked him, what, what, what's, what can we do for you? And he said, I feel so ashamed. All these other priests died, and I didn't. It took Dachau to get the mediocrity out of me. And there was 300 priests in the room listening to this, and there was just dead silence. It took Dachau to get the mediocrity out of me. So we should never settle. We should never settle for anything less than sanctity. Never settle for anything less than greatness. There's a future Irish saint who's well known to have said all or nothing. Sister Claire Crockett, you might be familiar with her. If not, We'll talk about her another day. Uh, but that kind of idea, you know, when it comes to the faith, it's not just, ah, sure, I go to Mass, or ah, sure, I pray the Owl Rosary every now and again, or ah, sure, I go to Medjugorje once a year, or whatever it is. But, I mean, in every single aspect of my life, 
all day. I want to be Christ-like. I want to be like Jesus. Is what our reading calls us to. I want to be like Jesus. Nothing less. So we ask the good Lord today, through the prayers and intercession of our Blessed Lady, to renew our faith, root out any mediocrity in us, to set us on fire with love for the Lord, that we may bear fruit, and fruit in plenty. Amen.